Hi there! I'm Cindy Linden, and this is the Cook Along Podcast. In my youth, I didn't care much for biscuits. Or I guess I should say I didn't care much about biscuits. They seemed boring to me, and I couldn't figure out why you would eat that when you could eat something either sweet or a little softer, like a dinner roll or something. Then one day, somebody, probably in a restaurant, served it to me, accompanied by honey butter. And once I realized that biscuits were really the perfect conveyance method for honey butter, then I became a fan, a big fan of biscuits. However, I never really wanted to make them at home. Now, there are some great biscuit recipes out there, and there are some that I am determined to try. Dinner biscuit things, butter biscuit things, stuff that just looks kind of amazing. But when I was younger, it all seemed like too much work. You know, you have to mix it by hand or whatever to get the butter mixed in. You have to roll out the dough, and then you have to cut it, and then you have to push together the scraps that were left over from cutting it, and cut it again. I was young. I didn't have time for that kind of stuff. I didn't care. Even the honey butter wasn't enough to prompt me to make those. My college roommate and I moved out of the dorm together into an apartment. And although I had grown up with Bisquick in the house, I never used it for anything. My mother probably used it for pancakes. I don't really even remember that. But suddenly there was a new use for Bisquick that I never even guessed about. My roommate introduced me to Drop Biscuits. Drop biscuits made with Bisquick are incredibly fast, very easy. They look shaggy and rough, but you don't have to cut anything. You just drop it on the cookie sheet and put it in the oven, and it comes out something soft and delicate that you can put honey butter on. And then, of course, by that point, I'd figured out the next shortcut, which is you don't really have to mix the butter and honey ahead of time. You can just butter the biscuits and let it melt and then drizzle honey over it. So I made drop biscuits for a long time. My kids loved them. They were so easy. They were so quick. It was a treat that we could have at the drop of a hat, drop of a biscuit. (laughs) But I haven't made them for a very long time. I probably am going back to that mentality where if you're going to have something sweet for breakfast, why would you settle for biscuits? And so I go to other sweeter, more cinnamony kinds of things, more bakery good kinds of things. But then I saw this recipe the other day for strawberry drop biscuits. The creator of the recipe is Jarell Guy, J-E-R-R-E-L-L-E-G-U-Y. This seems really easy to me. It's made from scratch, and the benefit is that it's going to use some of the strawberries that we have coming out of our garden in pints full. We get a pint a day, probably, easily, of fresh strawberries out of our yard, and this is a chance to use some of them. I am going to wash those up, and then we're going to make these together. It can also be done with blueberries or raspberries or diced peaches or plums or something. But obviously, I have the strawberries, and that is what drew my eye to it in the first place. So they win. If you want to make this along with me today, the ingredients are one and a half cups of all-purpose flour, a quarter of a cup of granulated sugar, four teaspoons of baking powder, six tablespoons of salted butter, about two-thirds of a cup of berries. So if it's strawberries, we're going to cut them into tiny pieces until they come up to two-thirds of a cup. If you're using blueberries or raspberries or something like that, just need two-thirds of a cup. Six tablespoons of heavy cream, that's whipping cream, and maybe a little more. Just a little tip also about whipping cream. Maybe you don't all keep whipping cream in your house all the time. I do because it seems to keep forever. I buy it in a bottle that keeps for months. If you don't open it, usually the best buy date on the outside is four months or five months or something from the time you can buy it. 
and then it keeps for a long time after it's open. So I always keep a bottle in my fridge, but if you are not that person, I also know that Trader Joe's and maybe some other people, it's just I happen to know about Trader Joe's, sells shelf-stable whipping cream in little pint aseptic containers, not even pint, a cup. They're probably a cup, which means they're shelf-stable and they're boxes like juice boxes and you can keep them in your pantry or your cupboard or whatever for when you suddenly need whipping cream and you don't have it in your refrigerator. It's really handy. I do have some of that in my basement, even though I always have one in my fridge because sometimes things happen like you open it and it's not good anymore. And then I go to the basement for my backup boxes of Trader Joe's shelf stable whipping cream. And then for a drizzle that goes over the top, which is I'm sure optional, if you wanted to use honey butter on them, you probably don't want to do this, but we also need a little confectioner's sugar or powdered sugar. Your do-aheads are to preheat the oven to 425 degrees and be sure that your butter is cold. This is such a nice treat from my usual baking project where the butter has to be room temperature or softened. This, we just take it out of the refrigerator and use it. And I mention that as a do-ahead in case you keep your butter on the counter and need to do the opposite and chill it for a little bit. And the reason that we want cold butter is because we don't want it to completely mix in. Unlike things where we cream butter and sugar together, we want the little lumps of butter that won't dissolve because that's what makes the biscuit flaky is having those little pockets of butter in the middle of the flour. The equipment you need are a sheet pan, a cookie sheet of some sort. You don't need a big baking sheet because this only makes six biscuits and they'll be kind of big, but it's still only six. I'm using a 10 by 15 inch cookie sheet. You need parchment paper, a whisk, a mixing bowl, a pastry cutter, although that's optional because you can use your fingers, a fork, a wire rack, and if you're going to make the glaze, you need a small bowl to make that in. Other than that, this is a one bowl recipe. We love those. Now, these are not going to be pretty. They're going to be craggy and bumpy and mountainous, but they're going to be crunchy on the outside and tender in the middle and just the right amount of light and fluffy moisture. So let's get started. One small note before you turn your oven on, I guess this is a do ahead, you also want to move a rack to the middle of the oven. Now I know a lot of things say middle oven rack, but the thing is it really does make a difference because if you want something brown on the bottom, you want the bottom rack. If you want something browned on the top, you want it up where the heat is rising. Something in the middle means you want a little of the best of both. So a little crunchiness on the top, a little crunchiness on the bottom. It kind of bakes things more evenly. So move your rack to the middle of your oven if you need to. And the other thing is that you don't want to be putting these biscuits in just as the oven beeps that it's at temperature because it isn't evenly at temperature. That means that the oven is hot at the top because that's where the temperature sensor is but it won't have reached down to the middle yet. So unless you wait a few extra minutes, maybe 10 minutes after it beeps, you will not be cooking at 450 degrees. You'll be cooking at something lower than that and your results will not be ideal. I have a feeling this is not gonna use nearly as many strawberries as I wish it would. Two thirds of a cup sounds like plenty, but actually, when you start looking at it, you realize it's really not that many. So if you're using strawberries like I am, you want them cut in small pieces, quarter inch, half inch, pretty small, because you want them to distribute throughout the biscuits and leave their little sweet berry goodness everywhere they go. More places is better. So don't be afraid to cut them really small. These don't cook very long, so they're not going to annihilate those strawberries. This recipe actually says that you only need four or five medium strawberries. Now, I don't know where this person, Jarrell, gets their strawberries from, but those would be huge strawberries in my neck of the woods. And I know that some of the California berries you can buy in the grocery store are huge these days, really monstrous. 
I guess I also could be wrong here. I've cut up two strawberries. Well, yeah, actually, and I already have a third of a cup. Well, that's so weird to me. Oh, no, that was three strawberries. Okay, I feel a little better. It just seems so odd that two-thirds of a cup is only a few berries. So there was five. This is the last of the ones I've washed. And that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, counting the tops. That's how I know how many I've used. Six sort of normal-sized strawberries come to just over half a cup. All right, so I'm going to wash another one. And add that, and we'll see where that takes us. That's close, but you know what? I, I just can't see why more berries wouldn't be better. So I'm going to pick two small ones here and put them in there. We raise, I think we're up to four kinds of strawberries in our garden now. We have alons, which are kind of citrusy, E-L-A-N, and they're big. And we have albions, which are ever-bearing and very nice. And we have quinault. But our favorite are the ones that come and go so quickly. Okay, that looks like two-thirds of a cup. I'm going to put another one in because I just think it's a good idea. The hoods are our very favorite strawberries. They are local to Oregon, where we live, and they are incredibly sweet. They are the only strawberry that's red all the way through. And because they are so sweet, they don't keep well. And that means they can't be shipped to other parts of the country. And that even if you find them in the market, they're only there for a very short time because they don't keep. The sugar makes them mold more quickly. All right, yes, I'm putting in one more. I just think a heaping two-thirds of a cup is probably better. Okay, that was the easiest part of the recipe. Now we need a large mixing bowl. I'm using large-ish. And we're going to put in the flour, which I'm doing in my standard way of aerating it first, stirring it up, and then scooping it with a spoon into the measuring cup. It seems to me that this is a place most especially where adding too much flour is going to make things dry and not light and fluffy. So I think it's good to fluff up your flour and make sure you don't pack it when you're putting it in the measuring cup. I cook with an unbleached all-purpose flour just because I don't see the point in bleaching it. Actually, and it just seems weird to me that you would need something that white. <laughs> and I mean that in, in some metaphorical ways as well. Like That seems very unnatural. And, you know, all-purpose flour, it's probably not that different uh, if it's bleached. One and a half cups of flour, lightly scooped into my measuring cup, and then pour it into the bowl. And then we add the quarter of a cup of granulated sugar, which... You'll note it's not a ton. It's really not a lot of sugar in this recipe. That means the sugar can come later when you add the honey <laughs> or whatever you top this with. You know, with the berries in it, maybe we won't need the honey. Maybe we just need the butter. I'm certainly not eating them without butter because even if they are no longer a conveyance for the honey, they absolutely will always be to me a conveyance for butter. Almost everything to me is a conveyance for butter. Hmm. The baking powder goes in next. You may have heard these called baking powder biscuits. That's essentially the same thing that Bisquick does because the dry ingredients are already mixed together, so you don't have to mess with them. Four teaspoons of baking powder. If you're worried that your baking powder might not be virulent enough to make your biscuit dough fluffy, you can test it. It does age. If you put a little in a tiny bowl or in a, even in a spoon and add a few drops of water, it should fizz. If it doesn't, then it means your baking powder probably isn't going to help your dough any. Now we need a whisk. And just whisk that together. And then we need the cold butter. 
it's just such a treat to be using cold salted butter instead of warm unsalted butter, which happens so often and I'm not prepared in advance for it. This is six tablespoons and there are eight tablespoons in a stick. So you need three quarters of a stick. Most sticks have a measuring guide on the outside if it's still wrapped in paper. If you have one that's out of its paper, get one that does have paper and hold it up until you can find that six tablespoons spot. I'm going to cut it into cubes. So first, just slicing it at about a quarter of an inch. And then we're going to turn them one, two, three, four, five. Six. Yeah, well, there you go. Six one ounce slices is how it came out. And then turn them flat, cut them in half again. And then I'm going to suggest not just another half to make it four pieces, but actually thirds. So each ounce is into six pieces. And then as you get those cut up, drop them into the flour mixture. Just repeat that with all the little butter pieces. Pats, they're pats. They're pats of butter, aren't they? No, I'm sure a pat of butter in a restaurant must be maybe half an ounce, do you think? That's never enough. I know that part. <laughs> it's never enough. I always have to say, hey, could I, could I have a couple of extra ones of those? Especially like for baked potatoes. They don't give you a, a pat of butter. you got to be kidding. Really? N needs at least two of those and probably three. This morning I was watching a video on Tasty.co with two chefs working together. <laughs> and one of them put some butter in a pan and said, oh, do you think that's too much butter? And the other, the other chef said, no, there's no such thing. And I, that's my sentiment exactly. No such thing as too much butter. You will have heard me say that. It was just nice to hear that echoed. So now we have this bowl with these butter chunks in it in a mess of flour. And this is the point where you can use a pastry cutter or you can use your fingers. I'm going to start with my fingers. Just toss the butter in. And what you want to do is squish those pieces of butter. The thing about the pastry cutter, it does make this probably faster, but it also sticks to the pastry cutter a lot. And so you end up getting it all over your fingers anyway. So what we're doing is just sort of rubbing the butter that's now coated in flour between our fingers to get it into tiny, tiny pieces. We want these pieces about the size of a pea. So that's, you know, not horrendously small, but it's going to take a bit. So we're just kind of munging up the flour with our fingers. You can do it in big pieces for a while and then squeezing the butter so that it breaks up and gets into smaller pieces. Now, as I told you, you don't want to eliminate all those pieces of butter because they literally do make pockets. It, when they bake, those little pieces of butter melt, but they leave holes behind them. So the butter goes into the dough at those points. Of course, that's a good thing. And they also leave little holes behind. It's like a lost wax process, if, if you know what I'm talking about, where the mold has been created, and then the thing that it was molded around goes away, but the mold remains intact. So you get these little pockets in the dough that make it fluffy and buttery. As I'm sure you will agree, even just in theory without tasting it, <laughs> those are good things. I am getting now to where most of the pieces are broken up. And what they've done is kind of flatten out. And now I have a few big pieces left and I'm just sort of rubbing them between my fingers so that I don't have huge pieces left. You can see this wouldn't have worked with warm butter. It would have just smushed in and then you would have had a pasty kind of thing that was closer to a wet dough than a dry pile of flour with lumps in it. And that would not be a good thing for your biscuits. Now know that sometimes your butter is going to smash together. Sometimes you're going to get big pieces. They're not all going to get the size of peas. But when in general you're seeing that most of the big pieces are gone and you're down to mostly little pieces, that's when you know you're ready to stop, which I think for me is now. So that was very fast. The next couple of steps are very short. They comes together really quite fast. We're about to add liquids to this dry mix 
And once you do that, it activates the baking powder, as you could tell probably from my description of it fizzing when you add water to it. And we don't want to activate the baking powder until we're about ready to bake. So if your oven is not at 425 yet, or more to the point, if it hasn't reached 425 and then stayed there with the oven door closed for another 10 or 15 minutes, you want to pause this and come back when your oven is at that stage. Well, my oven is finally ready. I have a very slow oven. Works great once it's preheated, but the preheating takes a long time. And the next step is to take those chopped up strawberries and drop them into the dough, batter, flour. You know, that flour mixture you have with the butter. Just throw them in there and then use the fork that I told you you're going to need. And just sort of stir those in so that all the strawberry pieces are coated with flour. And now we're going to add our liquid. You want to make a sort of a dip. They call it a well. You make like a little volcano. No, that's probably the opposite. You make a little dent in the center of the dry ingredients because that's where you're going to put your liquids. And we want to put in four tablespoons of the heavy cream. Then we're going to add a quarter of a cup of water. Now why, you ask, would you put water in here? Or even if you don't ask, I'm going to tell you, it's because that'll create some extra steam. The whipping cream is not liquid enough to create a lot of steam. I'm using the measuring cup that I had the strawberries in to measure the water, because maybe there'll be a little extra juice it'll pick up. Anyway, the steam will help them be fluffy and light. A little water in here is going to ensure the steam since the thick whipping cream isn't likely to do that. Now we want the fork again and we're going to toss this dough together until it's just sort of evenly damp, not even necessarily completely moist. And it's going to start to make a sort of a shaggy dough, which is kind of like what I described to you it happens with the Bisquick. This now is pretty. I mean, it's craggy and doughy, but the little strawberry speckles in there are fun. And the dough has turned just a tiny bit pink because of the juice from the strawberries. I'll take a picture and I will post it on the website so you can see it. Thecookalongpodcast.com is where you go to look for that. Now, we need a third of a cup measuring cup. We're scooping out about a third of a cup. And it's going to be a little over full, or you're going to have more than six of these and just drop it onto the parchment paper of your baking sheet. These are going to be big, but I figured you didn't mind. And do that until all the dough's used up. And then if you need to redistribute the dough so you get six that are about the same size, you can do that. I think I'm only going to get five, so I'm going to have to redo things once I get them all on the paper here. Don't try to make them beautiful. That's not the point. The point is that they're shaggy. And I suppose some people would say rustic and, well, I don't know, whatever. Yes, I'm going to get five. So I'm going to have to do some significant redistributing because I really don't want them that big. And they're all the same size. However, I want six. So I am going to start my sixth one now. I'm just going to take some with my fingers from each of these to make something that comes out so they're all about the same size and have about the same amount of berries in them. Oh yeah, this one was huge. Wow. Somebody would have been lucky on that one. This one's a little big. Okay, that's a lot closer. So now I have six approximately equal and equally homely drops of dough on this sheet except for the part I cannot get off my fingers. Now pour a little whipping cream, heavy cream, whatever you're using there, just a tiny bit into the measuring cup you were using. And using a spoon, or if you have one, a pastry brush, which I could have mentioned in my opening remarks, but didn't think to, but a spoon is fine. And just brush the tops of these lightly with the whipping cream. And that will help them look nice and also 
Give him a little golden sort of, not exactly a sheen, but kind of. It doesn't need a lot. And the reason I suggested using the measuring cup you'd already had out is just to save on dishes. Because as I've mentioned before in my house, we don't have a dishwasher, and so everything gets washed by hand. So the fewer dishes, the better. There we go. That was probably between two and three tablespoons of whipping cream to do that. Now at this point, instead of aiming for a glaze, you could choose to use some sparkle sugar on them. That's one of my favorite things. I talk about it often. Sparkle sugar is large crystals of sugar that are just fun. They make a nice fun crunch on the top. Fun to play with. Fun to eat. I am going to go ahead and go with the glaze that is made with confectioner sugar and whipping cream later on. But meanwhile, we are going to put these in the oven now on that middle rack and we are going to cook them for about 15 minutes. They should be deep golden brown and cooked all the way through and then we're going to take them out of the oven and transfer them to a wire rack where they're going to cool for five minutes. So you got that in the oven 15 minutes or until deep golden brown, not dark brown. Take them out, transfer them to a wire rack let them cool there for five minutes, and then come back to me. My biscuits are beautiful, and they look actually more like scones almost, sort of free-form scones than biscuits, but they look really good. Uh, now we're going to do the finishing touch. If you decided you wanted the glaze on the top, if I hadn't already said that cutting the strawberries was the easiest part, this would be the easiest part. We just need to put a quarter of a cup of powdered sugar into a tiny bowl, and then we're going to add a tablespoon of the whipping cream. I've used up all my tablespoons. Oh, for heaven's sake. Okay, well, I got a teaspoon here, and there are three teaspoons in a tablespoon, so I'm going to use that. Just add that to the powdered sugar. And then if you have a tiny whisk, you can use that. If you don't, you can just use the measuring spoon you just had out and combine them together. And you'll get a really thin white colored paste that just sort of drips. Now, if you haven't thrown out your parchment paper yet, you can reuse it at this point and stick it underneath the wire rack. You have to pick up your biscuits and put your parchment paper underneath you know what, I'm looking at this, and maybe this is overkill, but I think I'm going to do it anyway. I am going to get a couple more strawberries, find the softest ones I can find, and I'm going to mash them up, and I'm going to put them in this glaze, because, I don't know, because why not? Really, when you think about it, why not? So, I'm getting all the softest one out. Ones that were starting to go a little mushy that we would have had to eat right away anyhow. It's not a ton. I've got maybe the equivalent of two sort of smallish strawberries here. And I'm taking off the green part. I've got them on a plate. They're quite soft. And then I'm going to mash them with a fork. Yeah, see? So it makes all the juice come out. Yes, the juice is squirting everywhere. But I kind of want the juice to come out because then it's going to also... Add not just flavor, but color to this sort of glaze we're about to put on. Yeah. What could be wrong with that? Honest. This can't be a bad idea, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I'm going to just add that to this glaze. Try to get as much of the juice in. Sorry about all the noise, but I want all the juice in here so that it turns a little pink. And then mix it up again. Oh my goodness. Oh wow. Oh yeah, what I just did. All right. Taking a picture of this for the website. Holy cow. That was so totally the right thing to do. Oh my goodness. And now we just drizzle that. It should be pourable. It should be pretty thin, but you can use a spoon and just spoon it over. That makes it more likely you'll get even amounts on them. Oh, see. Oh my goodness, I would have been foolish to leave these out. If you have the opportunity to do that, it does make them much more beautiful. You want to distribute your glaze evenly over the biscuits. 
and the parchment papers underneath to catch what drippings there are. Oh, yeah. I'm so glad I did that. You know, my only regret is that some of it went down on the paper below. But I am actually going to rescue that and put it back on this biscuit because there is no sense in leaving it unused. Well, that was really fun. I feel actually really good about that last innovation. And I also found that the biscuits were fun to make as well. And I'm hoping you will find them fun to make. If you like this recipe, or even if you just like listening to me, I would be very grateful if you would take a moment and go to ko.fi.com on your browser and then slash the cook-along podcast and throw a couple of bucks my way to help pay for supplies. That would be really a big help and a good morale boost. Two weeks from today, there will be a recipe on this site for lemon icebox pie, which I got from Cook's Country. It's very easy, and it uses some of my favorite ingredients, and that's why we're making it. And it's summer, and it will be nice for summer. Even though it's a pie, you don't have to spend much time in the baking department, so it's not going to heat up your kitchen. And next week, there will be a quick bite podcast on whatever I feel inspired to talk about in the cooking realm. Enjoy your biscuits slash scones slash whatever these beautiful things are. And until next time, happy cooking! Happy cooking!